Hello. Thank you very much. And I'm so excited and humbled to be here this morning to have the opportunity to just share the word of God. And I would like to primarily just acknowledge the set man of God for the house, the Living Center Church of Christ, Bishop Jack, and of course extend my gratitude for the opportunity to stand here and be able to encourage each and every one of us, including those that are watching us right now. And I know that God has got something for somebody this morning. Turn with me to the book of uh, Genesis chapter number 47 and verses 1. The Bible reads, Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their heads and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. I want us to move to the book of Exodus chapter number 1. The book of Exodus chapter number 1. We'll start reading from verses 8. And the Bible says, Now there rose up a new king of Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. Okay. Okay, I lost it there for a bit. Yeah. So it says, Now there rose up a new king in Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal with them wisely. The word there is, let us deal with them wisely. And then it continues to say, And it came to pass that when they are falleth out of any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and also get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters, and afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. I want us to go over now to the book of Acts chapter number 7. The book of Acts chapter number 7. something over there as well. Acts chapter number 7, we're going to read verses 22. The Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. So don't mind me, we're going to do a little bit of a lengthy scripture reading, and then from there, I will build my case for this morning. I want to take you back to the New, I mean, to the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13. And we'll read verses 30. And the Bible says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. May God bless the reading of his word. Today I'll be sharing or discussing with you under the subject, Lord, open my mind. Lord, open my mind. Brothers and sisters, it is imperative that you understand that open heavens require open minds. Open heavens require open minds. It is very, very imperative as I build my case this morning that you come to a place of understanding that open heavens require open minds. The level of impact that you can exert from any divine visitation that is as a result of open heavens is mostly precipitated 
by how receptive your mind was. Uh, it is very, very critical that as the church we begin to move to a place where we do not pray for open heavens with closed minds. The church has been in a place where its influence has been limited because we have had the privilege to experience open heaven, but our minds were not open to be able to grasp the revelation that can change. The influence of the church greatly depends on how receptive the mind is in the season of open heavens. I know that right now the world is going through quite a significant turmoil that has been necessitated by the coronavirus. But during this particular period, there is an open heaven. And if you understand and if you'll agree with me, those of you that have, you know, smartphones or have access to social media, you will know that we are each and every day, every second, every minute bombarded with information, conspiracy theories and data that will just confuse and put you in a place of fear and you begin to question everything. You begin to question your faith at the end of the day. It is because the devil's agenda in this particular season is to make sure that your mind is in a state or in a place where it does not co correspond with the open heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be in an environment, you know, but if your mind is not in the right place, chances are that you may fail to maximize opportunities in that particular environment. Lord, open my mind. Even where piety is concerned, you have to understand that if you love God, you don't just love God with your heart, with your mind, I mean with your soul. You also have to love God with your mind. Lord, open my mind. Jesus one day was tested by the Sadducees and the religious leaders who were experts at the law. They approached him and began to ask him questions. Their aim was to test his intellectual prowess where legal matters were concerned from a perspective of religion. And they asked Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded and said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with your soul and with your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, you can love God with your heart. You can love God with your soul. But if you don't love God with your mind, it will be very difficult for you to manifest and reflect His nature. You can love God with your heart, but if you don't love Him with your mind, it is basically difficult. And that is why Jesus or the Bible does record and says, fix your mind on things above. It is very, very important that for spirituality to yield results, for you to begin to manifest the nature of Christ in your life, there is need for you to be able to fix your mind on things above. Lord, open my mind. The devil is in trouble this morning. I can guarantee you that. Now, the biggest challenge that Africa has, that is in gentlemen, is not necessarily our spirituality. is not necessarily the color of our skin. It is not necessarily where God geographically placed us. The biggest challenge that Africa has at the moment is its mindset. I want you to understand that Africa has continued to be a laggard continent, not because we don't have what it takes. Our mind is not in the right place. If we can get our minds in the right place as a continent, things would be different. I want you to understand that despite being an epicenter of spirituality in the Pentecostal movement, Africa still remains the poorest continent. It is because our mind is not in the right place. Allow me to submit to somebody this morning that with great endowments such as the gold, the oil, the copper, and you can name it that we have as a continent, that particular endowment requires or demands great mental responsibility. Is somebody with me in the house? It requires great mental responsibility. And there is need... This is what you see. We are living under open heaven 
as a continent. But because our mind is not in the right place, decisions that can change the trajectory of our economic development, of our socio-economic landscape, cannot be made. Lord, open my mind. Bible study number one. In the book of Genesis chapter number 47 and verses 1, the Bible introduces to us a time when the Israelites strategically occupies a place called Goshen. Now I want you to understand that Joseph was in a position where he could have negotiated with Pharaoh to place or allow the Israelites to, to, to settle at any other different place in Egypt. But strategically, Joseph, a man of revelation he was, had it on his heart to negotiate with Pharaoh so that the Israelites can occupy a place called Goshen. Now you have to understand that in those particular days or, in that, or around that time, Goshen was not really much that of a place that was paid attention to. It was not a very politically significant place for the nation of Egypt, which, by the way, was the epicenter of a civilization, industrial renaissance, you know, architectural renaissance. Ramesses and Pithom were cities at this particular juncture that were attracting the attention of the world, of antiquity. So this particular place did not bear any political significance to the Pharaoh. It, not, it, it did not bear any importance, economic value or whatsoever because Egypt had all it's needed in the other important and bigger cities. So when Joseph was negotiating with Pharaoh, he asked that the Israelites could be allowed to settle in that particular place. And I want you to understand that that particular Goshen was not only a place where Israelites occupied. There were also other people that were allowed to be able to stay in Goshen. Now, Goshen means approaching or drawing near. Goshen means approaching or drawing near. It also means a place of plenty or comfort. So as Joseph was negotiating for the Israelites to settle in Goshen, he was taking them to a place where there would where something on the agenda of God would be approaching where something on the agenda of God would be drawing near a place where they will enjoy plenty and comfort so it's not a place where you enjoy success only but in Goshen success comes with comfort and I want you to understand that in the book of I mean in verses 8 of Exodus chapter number 1 Something changes. The geopolitics in the nation of Israel begin to change. And a new Pharaoh ascends to the throne. And as he gets to the throne, the Bible says he knew nothing about Joseph. About the cordial relationship that this Hebrew man had formed with the house of Pharaoh. About any agreement or whatsoever. About any covenant you know, that was made between the house of Pharaoh and this particular nation. He did not care. He did not knew nothing about it. And he came to power. And the Bible says that this particular man realized and said, we have to deal with the Israelites wisely. This Pharaoh must have been a very critical thinker. Lord, open my mind. This Pharaoh must have been a very wise man who appreciated the art of mental engagement. So he comes to power and automatically begins to make some moves. And he says, look, we cannot allow these people. They live in a place where they're prospering, where they're multiplying, where they don't have a problem, where barrenness does not exist, where poverty is not there. Their harvest is you know, good, year in, season in, season out. So we need to do something about these particular people. Now, as a wise man he was, he devised a strategy. He devised a strategy that he would implement, which would chain the minds of Israel to a system of slavery. Lord, open my mind. He devised a system that chains the nation of Israel to slavery. Now I want you to understand that these were people who were living under a promise. These were people that knew that they had a great destiny. These are people that believed in the promise of God for their life. They knew that Israel was, I mean, 
Egypt was but a temporal place for them. They knew that God was taking them somewhere. They knew that they had a future. They knew that whatever was happening at the moment in their lives was but temporal. But on this particular juncture, Pharaoh realizes that the only way to subjugate a man is to control his mind. And he comes up with a system of slavery and begins to implement it on the Israelites. And this particular you know, system does, uh, you know, gets grip on the minds of the Hebrews. And ladies and gentlemen, this idea of slavery was so ingrained on the minds of the Israelites that they could not realize that they lived in a place that should have reminded them of the promise of God in their lives. They lived in a place that was speaking directly to what God was about to do in their lives. But the system that held their minds made sure that they could not realize that they were in a place that was announcing their miracle. I don't know right now, but the preacher is now coming in the room. I don't know if somebody is feeling it right now, but the preacher is now entering the room. I want you to understand that if there's a place where the devil wants to keep you, it is a place that, you know, where the revelation that God has for your life is kept hidden. If there's a place where the enemy wants to focus your mind, it is a place that keeps the promises of God hidden on your life. And Pharaoh understood that it doesn't matter the revelation that the Israelites had. It never mattered the promise that was on their lives. If only he could change their minds, he has overcome. I don't know about somebody, but I want to rebuke under this anointing every mental chain, every mental shackle that the enemy has placed over your life. I break it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. It doesn't matter where you are. I don't know about somebody, but I want you to understand that you can be in a place that is so bad and yet the bad in that place is meant to announce your miracle. You can be in a place that is so terrible and yet the terribleness of that particular place is meant to announce your miracle. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest tragedy that can happen to a man Christian or non-Christian is to be in a place is to be in a situation is to be or go through something and not understand the purpose and the place where you know that situation you're going through has for your life the greatest tragedy that can happen to anybody is not to understand why something is happening to you and why it is happening to you where you are at that particular stage in your life lord open my mind the israelites were so beaten up ladies and gentlemen that they forgot that god was preparing them for something big that they began to lose hope that there is no destiny that probably Canaan was but a fable I mean generations of slavery passed and if you ask the older Israelites because these were stories that were passed from generations to generations and I believe when they were busy you know making bricks and doing the manual work in Egypt they would even joke about the stories that their forefathers told them about a place called Canaan they would even say wow I'm sure our parents or our forefathers must have come up with the story to make sure that as we continue being slaves we comfort our hearts in Egypt but my brothers and my sisters these people did not understand that in the midst of slavery in the midst of a harsh system in the midst of a very difficult time the place where they stayed was announcing their miracle I don't know if somebody is catching me right now but I want you to understand that God is bringing you to a place where you understand that the bad place where you are is but a place that is announcing the good that is about to come in your life. I don't know if I'm communicating with somebody, but that very bad place of disappointment where the enemy has put you right now is but a place that is only there to announce your appointment. That place of delay where the enemy has placed you and you know somebody who's feeling stagnant right now like things are not moving in your life like stuff is not happening in your life I want you to understand that that place is only there to announce something bigger Lord open my mind I don't know about somebody but God needs to open your mind for you to begin to see that where you are is not who you are ah somebody missed that one 
I don't know if somebody is flowing with me right now. Where you are is not who you are. You may be in a place where you're broke, but that doesn't mean broke is who you are. You may be in a place where you don't have hope for the future, but that doesn't mean there's no hope for you because the Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to make you big. Plans to give you a great destiny. And that is what God is communicating to somebody right now. They were in a system that, ladies and gentlemen, began to make them doubt their identity in God. They operated under a system. You see, the system broke their spirits so much that they began to doubt. So much that they could not even believe nothing about what God revealed to their forefather Jacob. They were so much broken that they began to, you know, disbelieve and dispel what God spoke to Abraham. They were but just mere stories. I don't know if somebody has ever been in a place where you begin to ask God, did you really say that I'm going to be a great preacher? Did you really say that I'm going to be a great woman of God? Did you really mean it. Look, did I correctly hear from you when you say that I'm going to be a powerful business person? Because right now, it seems like nothing is happening in my life. If there's a place where the devil wants to keep you, ladies and gentlemen, it is a place where you begin to worry, where you begin to develop self-pity, where you begin to accept that your life was meant to be mediocre, where you begin to accept that you were meant to die and no more death. You were meant to die as a person that had no significant or impact in their generation. But I want somebody to understand that that devil is a liar because God has got something for you. His plans for your life never change. What he said he will do, he will do. And I want you to understand that every situation that the devil throws in your life is saying something. You just need God to open your mind to begin to catch that particular revelation. I don't know if I'm communicating to somebody. Whatever situation that the devil throws you in, whatever bullet that the devil shoots at your destiny is an announcer of something that God is doing or going to do in your life. Lord, open my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that they were so much committed to building Egypt. They were so much, you see, Pharaoh devised a system that subjected the Israelites to hard labor under the pernicious watch of serious whips. Whenever you are not working hard, they will whip you so hard that you will cry your lungs out. And ladies and gentlemen, this particular system just socially maligned them. They never care. But there is something that Pharaoh did not understand. I'm about to drop a bomb right now on the devil. The more the Israelites were being whipped, the more the Israelites were being kicked, God had a plan. He knew that somebody's mind must be opened. If these people are going to get to their destiny, somebody's mind must be opened. For every Israelite that was being whipped, God was raising a Moses in the palace. God began to plant seeds of desire for Moses to study. Acts chapter number 7 verses 22 the Bible says and Moses was learned in all the ways of the Egyptians how is it a coincidence that Moses must be studying the Egyptian system while his people are being fought by the same system ladies and gentlemen you cannot fight what you do not know uh, you cannot fight the enemy you do not understand strategy demands that you invest in research that you understand what you're fighting so the moment that Moses, the moment that the Israelites, the Hebrew boys, the youths are being discriminated against, being whipped, beaten against their will, at that very time, Moses is studying, trying to understand the system, my God. And how did Pharaoh even think he could defeat Moses? How did Pharaoh even think he could beat Moses to that particular game? So as the Hebrew boys have been discriminated, Moses is studying. God is opening his mind to understand a few things about the system. And ladies and gentlemen, the Israelites continue being beaten, brutalized, abused, beaten, denied of their human rights, being, you know, discouraged each and every day. But God has a plan. 
And what is happening is that Pharaoh does not understand that the more the taskmasters were whipping them, the more they were making them strong. My God, there was a 40-year journey that lay ahead. There was a desert that somebody had to endure. How do you endure a desert if you've not been whipped? How can you be strong in the scorching sun of a desert if you've not been caned properly? The enemy missed it when the Israelites were being whipped. As they were crying and complaining, the devil was celebrating and jubilating. But he missed the revelation that they were only being prepared for a 40-year-old journey. My God, I feel like having a praise break right now. They were only being prepared for a 40-year-old journey. I don't know about somebody, but right now, you don't understand what is happening to you. You know, the pain is so much that you can't even think. But I want you to know that it is preparing you for a journey to your destiny. It is preparing you for a journey, your journey to your destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, they were beaten. They were discouraged. They were spat on. All these things were done against them. But Pharaoh had no idea that this, you see, they were in a place where their minds became weak. It gave up to the system of slavery. It accepted the status quo. Their spirits were crushed. So if you take these people in the desert, they'll give up. If you take these people, when they reach the Red Sea, they'll just drown themselves because they've given up. So what do you do? You use a whip. I don't know how hard the devil is whipping you right now, but I want you to understand that that whip is only preparing you for God's blessing. That whip is only preparing you for the anointing that God is about to release on your life. That whip is only preparing you for double grace. That whip is only preparing you for your promotion. Some of you right now, even at the place of your work, there's a whip that is so much hitting you hard that... You know, you can't understand why your supervisors treat you the way they treat you. It's like you can't be accepted in certain specs or corners of your work. But I want you to understand that that whip is but preparing you for something great. Let's now get to this interesting gentleman by the name of Caleb. Now the Israelites, ladies and gentlemen, fast forward, leave Egypt. And reach now at a place where they could see their future but can't get there. I don't know if somebody has ever been in a place like that. But I can tell you as when so on I've been there. And there is nothing so painful. There is nothing so hurting. There is nothing so discouraging. There is nothing, ladies and gentlemen, so unbearable than being in a place where you can see your destiny but you can't get there. Where you can smell your miracle, but you can't have it. Where you can see the money, but that's it. Where you can see opportunity, but you don't have the piece of the cake. I don't know if somebody has ever been there. Where others are getting married, but you were no boyfriend. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been there. That's why it's not awkward. It's not easy. It's not easy. When, God, when is this ever going, when is this door going to open in my life? When is this blessing going to come a reality? I don't know if somebody has ever been there. Where you're asking yourself, I did everything that was expected of me. I went to school. I concentrated. I never went to no club. I studied. But I have no job. I drop applications like a madman. Nobody ever calls me back. God, what is happening? You feel so qualified, yet you are not certified for anything. I don't know if somebody has ever been there. I don't know if I'm communicating to somebody who's ever been there. You know the promises of God on your life. You believe in your heart that God never lied. You can feel that it's going to happen any day, but it's not happening. I don't know if somebody ever been there. This is where the Israelites, ladies and gentlemen, at this particular season of their life where they were at a place where they could see, where they could smell the milk, where they could literally test the honey. 
But ladies and gentlemen, they couldn't get to the place. They could see. They have plans. I'm sure some parents would wake up and look at Kenan and be like, my mansion is going to be located over there. I'm going to build an upstairs over there. There is my garage. There is my driveway. There is my study room, my prayer room, my living room. I'm going to mount my plasma right. They had all the, but they were not able. And you know what that does to you? If you are not very careful, it puts you in a place where you begin to doubt God. And that is what started happening in the nation of Israel. The people started, thank you very much. The people started, I only have five minutes. The people said, the people started complaining against Moses. They started telling Moses, you know what, I think this is a lie. How come we can't just have it easy when others are having it easy? How come we have to fight for us to get what we want? Because right there stood a very peculiar race. And those were the Anakites. These were giants. These were people whose physical stature itself was enough a defeat. In other words, you didn't have to fight an Anakite. Seeing one is already enough slap to make you give up. Because these guys were ridiculously huge. They were big. They are the muscles. These are the guys that you see on social media nowadays doing the trainings, you know, parading their muscles, showing their abs. They were like me with a six-pack. These were the Anakite. Don't argue. These were the Anakites, ladies and gentlemen. They had all the muscles. They had everything. And the Israelites looked at themselves. They had, hey, by the way, the Bible says that their shoes did not wear out in the desert. Some of them were wearing 40-year-old shoes. And then they were thinking, can these shoes honestly fight the Anakites? They were using the same weapons that they had for 40 years. They realized that it's not possible to defeat these particular people. And Moses, when he reached there as a leader, and Bishop will agree with me that this is the most difficult place to be as a leader. Governing people that are at this particular place in their lives is not easy, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to understand that we're supposed to pray and give credit to our pastors because it's not easy. Imagine the frustration that they have to have. These are the people who are responsible to lead us to Canaan, but you can't get there. So when you're angry at God, you are also angry at them. Imagine the pain that they feel. And at this particular juncture, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that as the community began to tell themselves, we can't do this, we can't go up. I mean, that's it. Let's just, I don't know, let's just go back wherever we came from and set somewhere. But Joshua, the Bible says, stilled the people and said, quiet everybody. I don't care what you're saying. I don't know. And I don't know. I am here under this anointing to silence that voice that has been telling you that you will only see Canaan but not have it. I silence that voice in Jesus' name. That voice that keeps telling you that COVID-19 will kill you. Silence it in the mighty name of Jesus. That voice that keeps telling you that yours will come after 30 years. I silence it in the mighty name of Jesus. So on that particular day, Caleb rose up under the spirit. Now I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that Caleb was a man whose mind was opened. In that very moment of discouraged despair, Moses tried all that he could. Moses, as a man who carried the stuff, ladies and gentlemen, went and tried and hit the ground, but nothing happened. The Anakites were still standing. Moses tried and pointed the stuff to the sun. The Anakites were still standing. Moses tried and performed all kinds of tricks. I, I'm sure he even taught it. Please, you once turned into a snake, turned into an elephant and killed these people. The stuff could not turn into an elephant because... That was not the purpose of God. And God, ladies and gentlemen, spoke to Moses and said, Hey, oh, Mo, you are approaching this thing in a very wrong way. This is not a battle of prayer. This is not a battle of miracles. You don't use the tricks that we used in the wilderness to defeat the Anakites. This is a battle of the mind. I don't know if somebody's tracking with me. At that very moment, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says all nations had heard that the God was doing spectacular things for the nation of Israel. That he defeated all the enemies that came along the path of the Israelites. So the Anakites at that very moment were scared of the Israelites. But Israelites did not know that the enemy they feared was actually afraid 
of them, God opened my mind. And in that very moment, ladies and gentlemen, something hit Caleb in the spirit and he stood up and said, everybody quiet, we are going to kill the Anakites. And for those of you that don't know, the name Caleb means raging with canine madness. So when he rose up, he was like, I am going to eat these giants for lunch. I don't know how big they are. I don't know how long it will take me, but I'm going to have them for my breakfast. If I can finish them, I will extend them to my lunch if i don't kill them by lunch i will have them for dinner caleb rose under rose under a different spirit now this particular gentleman realized that he carried the gene of a wrestler ah somebody is not following me caleb carried the gene of a wrestler he was a wwe superstar this is what the israelites did not realize <laughs> let me prove it to you the Bible in the book of Genesis says that one night Jacob wrestled with and overcame. So he understood that I'm not just an ordinary person. I have the gene that can fight and contend with angels and be able to claim my miracle. I carry the anointing to fight. Who are these Anakites that they can stop me from getting my miracle? If my descendant whose gene I carry was able to withstand God and get his miracle, it didn't matter the scar that he came out with, but he got his answered prayer. Caleb rose up and told everybody, if you all are not willing to fight, the Anakites, I don't care. I'm going to fight them. I will stand against them. I will do everything that I can to get my miracle because I know that I'm not going there alone. I am going with an anointing. I am going with a different spirit. I am going with the fire that my descendant Jacob used. I want somebody to understand as I get to conclude right now that God has got a bigger destiny for your life. But you need to come to a place where your mind is opened. If God can open our minds as Africa, we will understand that we are not a poor people. We just have a poor mindset. If God can open your mind, you will realize that there's a champion in you. If God can open your mind, you will realize that there are albums that God has deposited in your spirit. If God can open your mind, you will realize that there are sermons that will liberate nations that are hidden in your chest right now. If God can open your mind, you will realize that your mistakes have got no hold on your future. If God can open your mind, you will realize that there are open doors that are disguised even in places that don't look ready for you, that don't look right for you. May God open your mind. Is somebody with me in the house? May God open your mind. Until God opens our minds, we will not be ready for open heavens. I don't know where you're watching us right now, but I want you to start engaging the spirit right now in the mighty name of Jesus and begin to ask the Holy Ghost to open your mind. Because you need an open mind. If at all the season of manifestation can become a reality in your life, you need an open mind. If at all breakthrough can become a reality in your life, you need an open mind. Some of you have been stuck at the same place for a long time. But God opened my mind. I don't want to be professionally at the same level for 15 years. That ain't Winsome. That ain't me. That ain't me. God opened my mind. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. God opened my mind. I don't want to make the same mistake over and over again. God opened my mind. I don't want to fail at the same thing over and over again. God opened my mind. I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. God opened my mind. The living center church of Christ will not be the same. God opened our minds. My life would not be the same. God opened my mind. I will begin to trade on new territories. God opened my mind. I will begin to access new opportunities because God is opening my mind. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray right now, Lord, that may you open our minds to understand open our minds Jesus 
Open our minds to understand that the situation we are going through is but a prelude to the miracle that a situation realizing and in attacking our faith is but a step in the name of Jesus to my miracle. Lord, open our minds. We have prayed for open heavens for a long time and indeed you opened the heavens but our minds were not ready to download ideas that would change the trajectory of our families, to download ideas that would take us to new heights in our business. Oh, Jesus, open my mind, Lord. Open my mind. Every time God had to orchestrate a deliverance, somebody's mind had to open. For slavery in Babylon to end, Daniel's mind had to open. I don't know if somebody's tracking with me. Those whose mind were open. To the reality of Jesus being the Messiah in the time he appeared. We are able to experience the blessing firsthand of God in the flesh. But those whose minds were not open to the idea of Jesus being the Messiah. Missed out on the experience of God in the flesh. Lord open my mind. Open my mind. The greatest blessing that can ever happen to this generation is for a cadre of young people, women, men, and old people to come to a place where our minds will be opened. Only then, Messiah Ekesherebo Santa, can we begin to realize the promises of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. I give you the praise and I give you the glory. Lord, this morning I'm not praying for no car. I'm not praying for no material blessing. I'm not praying for no money. I just need you to open my mind. Just, just open my mind, Jesus. Just open my mind. The Bible says that Solomon was the greatest, richest, and most wisest leader that ever lived. Why? Because you opened his mind. Open my mind, Jesus. That's my prayer, Lord, this morning. Just open my mind. Open my mind.